Welcome to Fish Pals Focus. Today's guest is Jim Curry. Jim is the UK sales agent for Guideline and Untamed Angling European Ambassador. He's a renowned AAP guy, master instructor. He runs the Yorkshire Fry Fishing School in Northern England, offering tuition on the stunning rivers and lakes of Yorkshire, Cumbria and Lancashire. He's a writer and a rod tester for magazines, including Trout and Salmon magazine. Jim is widely regarded as one of the best and most knowledgeable teachers of fly fishing and fly casting in the UK. Welcome and thank you for joining me today, Jim Curry. Thank you, Anne. Lovely to see you. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How, how have you been coping during lockdown? Yeah, pretty good. I just kind of went into super training mode, really. You know, I kind of started running and um, cycling and doing triathlon. So it's just... Um, that side of me, that side of things kept me kind of sane, really, because mm -hmm. that lockdown with the fishing was tough for all of us, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think doing the exercise, because I know at the start of June, I did a um, John O'Groats to Land's End virtual with mm -hmm. four yeah, with four other people. And we did it in 24 days. We were called the strollers because we weren't very fit. But for mentally, the mental aspect of that has been brilliant. Yeah, I need to, I mean, you know, I kind of, both of us have chatted in the past about the running and everything, and I think the exercise for me has become, became increasingly important once the fishing was was out of the equation, really, because the fishing has been responsible, not just for kind of giving me a career in in the industry, but but just kind of banishing all kinds of demons and keeping me sane and, um, and being in that safe place, you know, down by the water. So uh, losing that, and I think having the exercise to fall back on was was really cool. So no, I just went into beast mode with the exercise and it just went completely bonkers. I know. I've, I've, if anybody has a look on your Instagram, you can see photos of you. Because um, you do triathlons, don't you? I do now. I just did a half Ironman uh, two weeks ago. And then um, I've got another one in about uh, end of September if it goes ahead. And then the, uh, the plan is to do Ironman Barcelona, the full one in October next year. Oh, good luck yeah. on that. Um, yeah. Fishing, because you, you've been in the world of fishing for many years. Um, mm -hmm. when, when did you start fishing? How old were you? I, I, I guess I, I started, I grew up in a fishing issue in household, which, you know, I was very fortunate for that. Mm -hmm. So at weekends, it was either go fishing or shooting with your dad or stay at home. So we just kind of went. That worked beautifully for me. It worked less well for my sister and my uh, foster brother who weren't that kind of keen on it. But for me, it was just awesome, man. So I, I kind of guess like, we started, like most people, I guess, started fishing maggots and worms and floats in the farm streams and on little lakes on family holidays down in Cornwall and places like that. Um, and then Dad started taking some fishing on the, um, on the River Findhorn. Mm -hmm. Some of my earliest memories are up in that, um, up around Glenfinness, Leithen Estates, around that area. And then we fished that river together for um, a lot of years. We ended up catching a lot of fish out of it. But when we first started, we were hopeless. We kind of both, both learned together. We didn't have a clue what we were doing. Really. But it's a beautiful river, and I've got a fabulous yeah. photo here. Tell us a little bit about this photo. Oh, uh, yeah. that's uh, Well, that's me with hair, obviously, with, with uh, my friend at the time, Peter, with my biggest trout that – it's actually got a pretty good tail on it, that one, from, uh, from a rainbow trout perspective. That was a little holiday cottage, some holiday cottage down at Tintagel in Yorkshire. And I think I fed about three kilos of sweet corn into the lake with my float and my hook. And finally, that thing, which looks covered in straw and is obviously dead. Uh, I think I'm probably grasping some money to pay for it in my right hand by the looks of things. Yeah, so, I mean, listen, that was... Um, that was my foot. That was um, one of those kind of moments that really started the whole thing rolling for me, really. And, and I was at school, you know, I was just, I was one of those geeky kids at school who I was avoiding homework, getting beaten up, and and actually turning in. And and for me, fishing was at an early age was just a place that um, was just a, a super safe place and a, and a super fun place for me. From that moment on, really, I guess. And it's a canny fish as well. <laughs> yeah, go ahead on that. I was made up with that. Much. I'd be made up with that fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so 
school was not really the the a great place for you um mm. you you went and uh, followed the passion of fishy yeah, and and went into the industry as a ghillie. So whereabouts did you you start as a ghillie then? I was on the west coast of Scotland on Letterview Estate, up towards Gaelock and um, Ullapool, around that neck of the woods. Yeah, I started when I was seventeen years old. So that's thirty, nearly thirty three years in the industry now. Wow! <laughs> so old. My God! No, you're not at all. So it was an amazing place to learn. You know, I actually started on um, as a ponyman, and a ponyman was job pretty basic was to take the ponies in the morning, walk them up the hill, wait for the stalker to shoot the the deer, strap the ponies, strap the deer to the ponies, walk the ponies back down to the bothy, gallop them and clean up the deer and everything, and then um, in a spare time we used to fish, and we had some fantastic brown trout fishing. Um, we had. Um, and Marie still had quite a few sea trout in. That's how long ago it was. That's how old I am. So we would still we'd still fish the kind of little the little streams and the little burns running into Marie on an evening. And then we had fishing on the U, and then we had fishing on the um, the Little Grinyard. Um, it was a bigger state. It was one hundred and thirty thousand acres. So it was a it was a feral chunk of Scotland. And then fortunately, because they knew I loved my fishing so much, they moved me from the ponies never been good with horses anyway to kind of more fishing related tasks and stuff yeah so they did that for three years till i was probably just over three years i think i came back when i was just short short of 21 back to england and what what kind of tips would you give to to people who who want to get a, a job in the the world of fishing i think the number one i would suggest is is just to do as much fishing as humanly possible hmm. i think um don't worry about likes on Facebook and how many friends you've got on Instagram. Just, you know, there is, that is a skill undoubtedly. And um, it is a great platform to give you the exposure you need to get yourself on the ladder, whether you want to be a guide around the world or a fishery manager or a ghillie. It can help. But ultimately, as much exposure as Facebook will give you, if you haven't got the background and serve an apprenticeship, it will expose you. So there are no shortcuts. So go fishing, enjoy yourself, and don't take it too seriously. It's fishing, <laughs> just go and enjoy it. I know people do take it seriously, yeah, don't they? Yeah. And I, I think sometimes people lose the fact that we're going fishing. I know, yeah. for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's quite a complicated sport now. If you know, if you think about, if you think about all the kit and the gadgets that that we can bolt on every year, there's new products from all the retailers, and it's a bit bamboozling. I understand that. And, it, you know, sometimes I sit in the sales meetings, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to get my head wrapped my hand around another line concept. But ultimately, it's a very simple sport. And you know that. We both know that. We both spent enough time in a way that's now throwing these fly rods around. You know, it is – you are – as long as if you, you appreciate where you are, that you are entering an environment which is not your own, and the more time you spend by the water, not necessarily even with a rod in your hand, the more you absorb where you are and. The, you know how to approach the rivers and all these these incredible fish then um it is pretty goddamn simple we do a great job of trying to complicate the whole thing but it is ultimately it's a very simple sport which is good because i'm a simple man as you know well do you know something i when i first started i um it was like a massive learning curve for me and what i did do is i actually went and spoke to a gilly and said could i come along and just walk the river with yeah. you and yeah. he just talked me through um, the water and all the pools and everything. And that's how I was able to, to get some knowledge right from the start. Because yeah. back then, being a female yeah. on your own, it wasn't the, the easiest, no, um, uh, you know, to actually go fishing. Now, you are part of Guideline. I am. And we've just been, before we started this, we were chatting and I said, do you know something? I've got my fishing rod right next to me and it's my guideline yeah. rod. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you're the UK sales agent for Guideline. Mm. Yep. Tell us a little bit about Guideline because um, for, for people that, that don't know who Guideline is. Yeah. So they are, uh, I've been with Guideline for about five years now. 
Mm -hmm. uh, my first proper job, I guess, that wasn't working for myself, so that came as a bit of a shock to the system. But I couldn't have got involved with a better company, really, for a couple of reasons. Guideline are a company which is 26, 27 years old now. They are um, they were born out of um, a group of friends who are absolute fly fishing assassins, trout fishermen and salmon fishermen. The, the, those guys are still involved today as the directors and sales managers and shareholders. Um, so it's a company which has its roots in Scandinavia, in Norway and Sweden. That's where the two offices are. Um, all the rods, the reels, the lines are tested in arguably some of the toughest, roughest, hard-fought battles you will ever find when you come to hooking salmon and trout and big fish in wild places. So the, the stuff stands up incredibly well. The nice thing about it, Anne, really, is that the company's grown significantly, undoubtedly. We have in life staff mode, I would suggest, arguably today, right now, probably the finest rod designer and hardware designer. Um, life, I think, is in his late 50s, early 60s. God, he's going to kill me if, he, if he's not 60. But he, A, he's one of the nicest guys on the planet. B, he's an ex-world champion caster. C, he's a fantastic fisherman. But his product knowledge, um, when it comes to designing fly rods, reels and fly lines, is just otherworldly. So I'm very fortunate. I can't think. It's got to be the best agent job in the industry, I would have thought, because they're the coolest set of guys. And when we do a sales meetings, we do a sales meetings on these amazing rivers in Norway, and you're like, we just get this PowerPoint presentation out of the way, and we can get our waders on. And I get the feeling that Guideline is very much a family. It's a family, and because the guys have been together for so long, exactly. um, and they, 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 you know, they've all evolved, haven't they? Really? Yeah, and they're so good at it, and they're so open at sharing the information. I mean, I, you know, I've been really lucky fishing around the world, Anne, but um, from a fat lad from Yorkshire, I've managed to get myself around a wee bit, but. Those guys have taught me so much in the last four or five years. I mean, you see the on the trout fishing and the salmon fishing, they're just, they are absolute assassins. And then they're lovely at sharing that information, you know, and that knowledge with everybody. They approach the salmon fishing in particular in a completely different way than historically we do in Scotland and Ireland. You know, the lines, the angles they cast, the flies they use, how they, and man, they catch, those boys catch some fish, right? Oh, well, do you know something on the D? Because the D is one of their favourite rivers um, for the Scandies. Oh, my goodness. It is such a different attitude. And yeah. the other thing as well is, is that I just think the kit that they wear as well is just yeah. the cool. It's like, you know, everything that, you know, when they're on the river, they're just full on. Yeah, the machines, aren't they? Oh. Yeah, they just kind of bought up. In a, in a very outdoorsy kind of environment out there, you know. If you don't fish, you shoot. And if you don't shoot, you ski. And you probably do all three. And from an early age, you, you kind of find your way in, in nature. And that shows us the way they are. they just got a really cool kind of attitude towards the fishing and the, and the outdoors in general, really. And, cool. and I love them to be to death, those guys. They're great. And, and the thing is, is that the, the range of products that they, they offer, um, I'm going to quickly put this slide up, but I, I don't want to talk about this slide at the moment, but okay. everything that they offer, yeah. they <laughs> I'm memorising the prices on all those. <gasps> yeah. yeah, so but, the one thing I want to talk about is the new range of rods called Elevation. Talk, yeah. talk about Elevation. I'm going to put a screen up. Cool, yeah. So this was um, guideline. This is something that guideline have been talking about for a while, really. And I think that the concept comes from the fact that we make our living on the back of and in harmony with Mother Nature. And as such, we have a responsibility to make sure that the products that are entering our countryside, where we chase these beautiful fish, is as sustainably sourced as, as possible. So if you look at something like that range of elevation rods, every conceivable part of that rod, from the the unground blank, the rings, the resin used on the in the cork, the uh, 
the, all the fixtures and fittings and pretty much every conceivable aspect of that image you're showing there has been sourced as environmentally friendly as, as possible right now. Now, there are still moves to be made and there are still improvements to be made, but this really was a, a statement for, from us um, about how seriously we are taking this um, the environmental factors and our responsibility as a company um, in this world in these challenging times. So that rod, in particular, the really cool thing about that rod, yeah. other than the green issue, is just how goddamn flipping light it is. The the nine foot five weight, for instance, is the lightest five weight on the market. Period. And the the fourteen and fifteen foot salmon rods, man. If you can find a lighter salmon rod up out there for three times the cash, and they're not a lot of money, they are incredibly, incredibly light. And that's due to the fact that life, being an absolute wizard with all this stuff, has found a new way of of um, of, of kind of fine tuning how much carbon fiber and against how much resin goes into the construction of the blank. So they are incredibly light. I mean, incredibly light. The fifteen footer feels like a twelve footer. The five weight feels like a three weight. <laughs> It's great. They're a great range of rods, but the message behind them is important. Oh, definitely. And and would you say that companies are going to be going more towards the green construction of rods? And, yeah. and I think I think the, the time's right, really. I mean, everything is driven really from a consumer perspective. You know that. So, and I think that um, probably until probably two or three years ago, I don't think the market, as much as we all love nature and we, we kind of enjoy it and touch it and get closer to it than most people um, as fly fishers, um, I don't think maybe the market was ready for it, but I think the message is an important one now. And I think um, the, the time is absolutely right. The retailers have been very happy with the message behind it. We feel a lot more comfortable knowing that we're looking at all the products in the range and assess, reassessing them with regards to the impact. It's like, you know, the plastic spools that we've spent God knows how many years between us winding lines off and on. We did away with those, right? That saves 10 tonnes of those useless plastic spools, 10 tonnes in guideline sales. So we've replaced those with like a, with a cardboard version, so sustainably source cardboard, that type of thing. Everything to do with the, with the packaging, you know, the rods, the fly lines, whether we continue to use fluorocarbon, everything's being assessed now from an environmental perspective, and it's important. It really is, and uh, the consumer, when they actually buy that product, they know that they they can throw it away, uh, recycle yeah. it back, and it'll go back in. Um, th the other thing I was going to say as well is is that um, with reference to the the range as well, has, has this been covered by Trout and Salmon or any of the magazines? Is it coming into any of them? What the which one's the elevation you say? Yeah. yeah, has it been covered? Mm. Yeah, no, it's had a bit of coverage. It had a bit of coverage. I mean, I think we, we did something in Trout and Salmon with Andrew and the guys over there on that side of it. It's been pushed on our social media channels and and on the website. The really cool thing is, in particular, during this lockdown thing, the sales on the single handers have just been spectacular. I think the message is important, of course, but it's a kick-ass range of rods. So mm. when we could, like at the moment, right, we were all desperate to get to Scotland because Scotland's full of fish if we're if we're living in England, and um, we've got nowhere to stay at the moment. So the trout fishing closer to home, mm. I think, has been kind of accessed more readily than ever before, and that range of rods. You think the off the top of my head, like the nine foot five weight's about two hundred quid. Well, it feels about it feels about two hundred. It feels about four hundred and fifty five hundred quid before you put a line on it. And then it just feels absolutely priceless, quite frankly. It's a stunning range of rods. Okay. Where, where can you buy these rods from? Are John Norris stocking them or? Yeah, so all the major players, you know, is with, with reference to um, fly fishers, supplying fly fishers. So the John Norris's, the Glasgow Angling Centres, the Finn and Game, Angus Angling, um, you know, guys at Sportfish, uh, Andrew Ryan at Connor Nav in the South, in the Republic. In the North, you've got Serious Country Fishing, um, Serious Country Sports, those boys up there. So, you know, you can find it from any of your major retailers for sure. But yeah, the feedback on them has been spent 
been spectacular. And Con, you know Con from Tame Mount, don't you? We are. Oh, Con's so nice. Well, I'm yeah. going to put up the photo here. If, well, no, can I put the photo in up of your dad, or are you just going to talk about Con? Because he is a star. No, no. Well, I, well just just quick thing about Con. Con is a is he's um he's on our pro team. He is um, the head gilly at Tame Mount. He is. Um, He's everything, you know, if you wanted somebody to kind of, if you were just getting into the sport and you were kind of 15, 16, 17 year old young girl or a young lad wanting to get in and, you know, if you do as much fishing as Con O'Day and you're as giving and generous with your time, um, somebody will come and snap you up. He's, he's an awesome caster and a fantastic fisherman and a lovely guy and um, he's just done a piece on those double-handed elevation range. He's been slaying fish. Left, right, and centre on him recently. Go on, flash up that picture of my dad because I love seeing that picture. Oh, I know. You're the photo of your dad. Tell us about this. Yeah. Oh. So that's kind of, yeah. Yeah. So this is um, this is a kind of a, a, a toughie for me because um, I've, I've been really lucky, as you know, travelling around the world and um, I've fished in some incredible places uh, and I've caught some some incredible fish um but last year dad's not been too well heart's been been pretty been pretty roping continues to be but he's soldiering on bless him and um he hadn't been fishing because he'd been poorly for quite some time and um we, we booked a couple of days with fish pal and you'll be glad to know and um we uh we went up to tame out and and we con took us out and then we had two days in the boat and um it was in august it was really dry there wasn't any fish about there was a few there wasn't any water um and then on the second day dad's getting tired um and then con we were looking i was looking at con con was looking at me and then we went down we we're on the bottom bit going down towards the lynn pool there and um yeah con's like 20 to 6 we're gonna have to i should be back you know, and dad's like, it's fine, it's fine. And um, I'm not kidding, he made one cast, basically the last cast, and we saw this thing coming out of the depth, and um, and yeah, it was that, it was that, 18 pound fish. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And I remember coming down that pool with my dad and Con in the boat, and, I, and I'm not a religious guy in any way, shape or form, you know, but I, I remember thinking, if there is if there is somebody up there, if there is somebody watching, if somebody could just bolt this incredible old guy at one last fish on the end of his line right now would be would be the perfect moment. And it happened, yeah. It was awesome. It was awesome. The most special memory I've ever had in, in fly fishing. Nothing comes close to that. And that's why this sport is so special, and because it it brings people together. You know, crazy. Oh, I'm getting all teary. Oh, I'm, yeah. sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm joining you. And do you know something? Khan is he's, 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 he's a legend. He is a legend. He's just fabulous. And if you haven't had a chance to go and fish Taymond and the Lynn Pool of all pools. Yeah, amazing. Oh, gosh. Oh, the yeah. Lynn Oh, one of the one of the the sweetest pools on the River Tay. So, um, talking about big fish, um, you and because I, I want to talk about the untamed angling yeah. European ambassador. Yeah. Um, just, just, just tell us a little bit of who they are, actually, please. Yeah, sure. So this is um, Rodrigo and Marcelo. To um, Rodrigo um, from Brazil, Marcelo from Bolivia, who run um, a stable of super high class lodges in the Brazilian and Bolivian government. They are undoubtedly some of the finest um, fishing lodges with reference to the standard and the level of accommodation and food that I've ever, ever fished or stayed at and i've stayed been fortunate enough to stay arguably at the very very best ones um and all that is done amidst the most incredible environment and fishing location on the planet 
Well, I've got a photo, and I, I, I just want you to talk me through this bit. <laughs> yeah, that's meant. So that's like a couple of years ago now. That See how tiny that river is, Anne? Oh. Uh, that, it's tiny, crystal clear. So for those of people who are watching who may have fished in New Zealand, that this, the South Island New Zealand, the west coast of New Zealand, is about as close to anything I've ever fished. So we were sight fishing for these enormous predatory golden dorado, which behave like wrecking machines for a few hours of the day when they're just eating everything and killing everything. And then they kind of have this switch that they flick where they turn into the most paranoid brown trout the world's ever seen. And I actually got that right at the end of um, right at the end of a day. So that is that's a long way away from civilization. That's two and a half, three hours in a small plane over the Amazon. Then it's another two hours up in a motorized canoe. And then that's a day and a half uh, in a um, pole in punting canoes. And then that's about half a day's walk. Um, and that was on a floating mouse. So the floating mouse was just going, and this thing came up. And when I hooked it, the guide said, right then, he said, when you hook it, he said, if you hook it, you've got to hold it. Well, I mean, it's like holding onto the back of a Ferrari. So I held it once and I turned it away from a tree and the flipping line slipped out of my fingers. It went straight across the river. It went round a tree trunk, jumped over it. He dove off the bank, swam out. So he's under the water wrestling. I could see the kind of Dorado kind of doing this under the water. You know that thing where you get a fish snagged and like the lines kind of fish is down here and the lines at a funny angle. And the next thing, the line snapped. So I kind of ended up sat on my ass with like half a fly line. I was like, oh no, man, it's over. And the next thing, the guy, Guido, bless him. Um sorry, not Guido, it's his twin brother, it's equal. Um We'd have guys down on, on Tierra del Fuego and as equal guides, his, his camp manager at um, that lodge. He got the fly line, what was left of the fly line, wrapped around his hand and this kind of golden dorado on the other side. Yeah, that the, the Amazon jungle is the most incredible place I, I have ever been. Wow. I mean, it, it's incredible. And I don't, it's so incredible. I don't know what to say to describe it, really. You know, when you look at the... Some things are so big and so vast, you can't wrap your head around it. It's like when you look at the wealth of Jeff Bezos, you know, the Amazon guy, and you see all these kind of zeros, you know, and he's turned over a trillion dollars or something. It just doesn't make any sense. And when you're flying over the Amazon for two and a half, three hours in a plane, and all you're seeing is trees, and you're nowhere near the <laughs> middle of it. The scale of it is um, is quite incredible. The most beautiful place on the planet. Yeah, amazing. It's so mental as well. And and you have obviously people can just go and um, check you out on uh, Facebook to get information about this as well. Because do you do hosted trips there as well? I do. I do. I take trips. I'm going for my fifth fifty in November. Huh? So um, I'm older than Yoda now. So I'm going to go and um, from in my 50th year, I'm, I'm going to take a group uh, out to uh, Rio Marie to fish for the peacock bass, which I did in giant peacock bass, which I did back in January. Um, that's in the Brazilian Amazon. So I could have picked anywhere for my 50th birthday bash. Um, so I, I'm going back into the Amazon because I love it. Well, good on you. And I know that um, obviously you, you've been around the world fishing um again yeah argentina just tell us about argentina. it sorry <laughs> yeah that was, that's my biggest sea chart right i've been to argentina a lot i've been really lucky the crazy thing is i never really fish much because you know when you're hosting trips i've never been a host that would fit yeah. seems kind of weird and people would say well what's your biggest sea chart in argentina knowing i'd done like 20 odd weeks on in Tierra del Fuego, and you go, oh, I don't know, it's about 14 pounds. They're like, what? That's the average. I said, I'm not fishing though. But that week I did fish, uh, and I have started fishing a little bit more. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that's that was, I think that was 21, I think, something like that. Um, and I got it on, that was on an upstream nymph under a dry fly, bizarrely. Like kind of clink hammer duo New Zealand dropper thing. The pool was just full of fish and we just couldn't touch them. There was a big run came in and the flipping things were everywhere. And like 
me and my pal, you know, we can both we've both done a lot of fishing and we were covering them and we were trying lines and flies and not even a pull. And the river was boiling with the things. And we were like running out of time on that session. And the guide went, I can get one of these if you don't mind doing something a bit weird. And I was like, Yeah, whatever, I'll, I'll do anything to catch one of these. So they were all about that size. And he put this great big ugly dry fly on and then just hung this um size 12 print sniff print nymph about two and a half foot down underneath it and then first chuck it just slid away and it was that yeah argentina's a really cool place the people are amazing as well the food's oh. really good and and the the one thing with argentina is that you you really do have to be able to cast to go there don't you because it's you know what though i, I i've heard that a lot and i and i most of the time that wind blows off the Andes, it blows downstream. Yeah. And the way the Rio Grande is just trying to, it just does this the whole way around. Mm -hmm. So you can always, I mean, I've had people there who've virtually never picked a rod up before and they've all caught fish. Because if you get the wind behind you, you know, everybody thinks of Scott McKenzie. Bless him, Scott. Shout out to Scott. Um, you know, because you can find a spot there where the wind will be helpful. If the wind blows upstream and it's strong, it doesn't matter if you are Scott. Mm. We're all going back to the lodge. <laughs> you know, it can't, it can't. I've seen it, and I've been down there. And, and at the end of a week, people have gone. What are we on about? It's not even not even got remotely windy. You're talking about I've got all these clothes on, and it's and like I've stayed there for another group have come in, and it's been 130, 140 kilometers an hour, and we're literally two of us trying to drag a truck door open to get a client out because he's got sandwiched between the door and the fuselage of the truck. <laughs> it's blowing all the water out of the river. So it's it's an amazing place. It's another place that would be on my bucket list. The, the jungle that Argentina, without a doubt, just from a cultural perspective, and it's the last great sea trout river. There are still a number of great Atlantic salmon rivers. There's only one really, truly great for me sea trout river left on the planet, unfortunately, and that's the Rio Grande. So... That one, if you're a destination angler, you need to tick that box. Fish are enormous. And the other one's Russia, probably, still. I think I love Russia. I think it's just, it must have been like England and Scotland 150 years ago, you know? It's kind of wild and untamed and, and full of fish. Well, there, I've got a Russian photo as well. I've done my research. Um, no. Yeah, that was um, middle Varzuga last year. That was a crazy week. I got 107 fish. I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous, but we, I, but for a week, I mean, it was insane. All on floating lines, and um, all on little flies, and we were like fishing little hitches, and um, and the thing with the middle Varzuga, it's not they're not big fish out there. That was pretty probably one of the bigger ones for the week. But as far as um, sports concerned, and getting your string pulled. And think that's yeah, that's that's the that's the home pool at Middle Barzuga, and uh, right, kind of top end of it, um, just stunning. And because, and listen, I, I don't get as much chance to fish for salmon as, as I'd like to. I, one other thing about the COVID thing is I'm definitely making more time for fishing. That's just happening. And um, but when I'm out there. I just went completely not since sleep for two days. I just just stayed in my way. I must have stunk. <laughs> Um, you have started guiding again, so this. Yeah. Yes, mm. we honestly, because you know you are there going on about all these fish, but mm. if you, you know, you you're up with the Scott McKenzies, the Ian Gordons, the Ian Fairgreaves, you know, you're up there with the guys who can. No, can very kind, but those guys are super special. Though. You are, you are very, very understated. You are, and you know that. Um, but you, you started guiding, and this is a, a photo, um, quite recent as well, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. That's in Yorkshire. That's on the Swale. Um, I've really enjoyed fishing the Swale this year. It's got some goddamn huge fish in it. I'll tell you what, it's got some brownies that have made you, that have got me super excited. I had a pal of mine on there the other day and um, I was guiding on the Ewer on Tuesday and we should have been uh, for trout and salmon um, and we should have been on the swale at that spot and my mate had one um, 23 inches 
which is a huge fish. You know, depending on the, I haven't seen a picture because he couldn't get a picture, couldn't get his hand around it because it was that big. But 23 inches probably puts it in the kind of, certainly in the five pound category. Um, but are we up to salmon on the year on Tuesday, my client? Yes. Oh, there is salmon on the year. So. All the fish, man. Everywhere is full of fish, isn't it? Oh yeah, and it's 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 just about getting out there because I know Tom uh, early on this week when we did the uh, the live, he, we were just talking about the places where people are catching fish, and it's about getting out there because we don't know what the end of the season is going to be like. It's about getting out there, going fishing. But I, I just love you know the not only the salmon, the sea trout that are in the systems, and of yeah. course beautiful wild bone trout. Yeah, it was a belter. It was a, it's, um, we've had some crackers out of that river. We've seen some humongous fish. There's also that bit, some really nice barbel. So we're, we're going to try and get, when the water drops, we're going to stalk a few big barbel in there. That would be super fun. But, you know, what you were saying about the salmon and really important, I think. I think, you know, there can't be any, we've not talked about this yet, but there can't be any coincidence that I speak to my accounts all over England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. Every single one of them is full of fish. Mm. Every single one of them. So there has to be a correlation between all these super massive factory fishing boats hoovering up everything with a fin and a gill that swims our oceans yeah. and this immense number of fish that are returning. Some of the stories I'm hearing about the ridge pool. Um, the moy, the sewer, having more fish in it than it's had for 25, 30 years, you know. And honestly, if you'd have seen those fish on the – there was the lads on the opposite bank to us on the ewer. I mean, I know the ewer's got fish running back under the season. It's early July. They'd five fish in the morning. Yeah. They're everywhere. And the thing is, is it's because the big boats haven't been out, isn't it? Yeah. No. So, yeah, and uh, I just hope that these fish get the, the chance to spawn, um, yeah. and, you know, and they're able to get back out because uh, it is quite a daunting life. The, uh, the fish do lead when they're out there as well out in the sea. But mm -hmm. I do have the Atlantic Salmon Trust coming on um, later on, on on these shows. And I've also got a guy coming on to talk about tuna. Okay, it cool. Yeah, because the tuna population, because um, don't forget, in the 1920s and 30s... Yeah, um, and everything, right? Yeah, Yorkshire coast was a tuna yeah. destination. Yeah. So, even John... Oh, cool. I'll tune into that. Yeah, so... But guide... So, obviously, people can contact you for guiding. And I just wanted to show this photo of the guide... Um, fly, guideline fly fish... Um, Facebook page, not yep. Facebook, website. You know, you've just got some amazing um, ambassadors, haven't you? We've got some brilliant ambassadors. We we made it. We made a thing with them. Here's the thing with the ambassadors, right? Is that we we undoubtedly now live in an age where there are more, everybody's a pro guide and everybody's an ambassador. And I'm not knocking that because if you get a little foothold, toehold somewhere, you've got to grasp it. At Guideline, we look at things very different, differently. We have a small team. Um, everybody is is there for a reason. Everybody on the team, whether you're a pro member or an ambassador, has served that apprenticeship. You will be considered to be a an expert in your field. And um, so we keep that team small. And that means we hopefully we look after the guys very well. Um, they help us a lot with products um and feed into that side of things um and we're, we're a good bunch we're, we're you know it, we just took a different approach and we, we don't have lots and lots of pro members and ambassadors and we're just i just want i just wanted a i wanted the, the best group i could assemble and we're very lucky con um you know with kevin shown in republic um uh, chris haig um, Lewis Hendry, Alex Jardine, um, you know, the, the, all the guys out there are, are doing a fantastic job, you know. I'm very proud of them. They're a good bunch of boys. They're good to fish with. They're good fishermen. Yeah, and also as well as that they are, you know, you've mentioned Alex Jardine, you've mentioned Khan and everybody else. They are leaders in what they do. And yeah. uh, 
follow them on their social media. Oh, just absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Um, fish. Yeah, they're living it, aren't they? They're yeah. living it. That's the thing. Yeah. It's not. It's not a hobby. It's not even a life. It's not even a livelihood. It's just a way of life for these guys. Yeah. That's and, the way it be. and they're also kind as well with their knowledge. They so are. Hundred percent. They share. As yeah, well. that's the way it should be as well. It's just every. You know, there's no secrets. We're all here to. I say I've learned so much. I had Lewis, I was fishing with Lewis Hendry about two weeks ago. We were doing some filming upon the Eden. Oh my God, that guy is just some kind of freak of nature with those nymphs. It's just the stuff he can do. You're just like, what? How are you doing that? And he tells you, you know, it's just like, and that was like every day is a school day, right? When you're on the river. Oh, and if it isn't a school day, then um, it's all about opening your mind up because um, you can always learn something new. And it's only yeah. going to have a mission as well, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So people, obviously, people can get a hold of you at the Yorkshire Fly Fishing School. The best way to get hold of me, if you would like to endure a day's guiding with me, and let's, I'll be honest, it is, it's an endurance task because I don't like to finish early if the fishing's good. Um, I, you can reach out to me on um, Facebook, uh, just search Jim Curry, or you can find me on the guideline um, guideline website. I'm on there. I'm on Instagram, uh, guideline fly fisher. Um, but yeah, you don't have to look that hard to find my big bald ugly head on. Well, what we're going to do is um, when this goes out next week, we're going to put a, a ticker tape along the bottom so Perfect. people can actually get in contact with you, Jim Curry absolute pleasure chatting to you again it's been a long time <laughs> no, it's been too long i think london probably since last time we were hanging out having a beer yeah so but you take care of tight lines and, and to you. say hello to your dad as well and tell him well done on that fish so yeah. you take care my lovely <laughs> right. Bye -bye.